Hello everyone, uh, my name is Abdullah Zagbor and today with Mohammed Bukhamsin we will be covering the geothermal heat pumps which is going to be chapter 11 of the book. Now I'm going to be doing the first 10 pages, so I'm going to be uh, talking for the first 20-30 minutes where I'm going to basically explain just the simple process of how heat pumps work, the thermodynamics behind it, um, how it it works in a geothermal setting, whether cooling or heating buildings. And then Mohamdou Khamsin should cover the second half of the book with a bit more calculations and other external factors. So to start things off, we'll, we'll start simple. We'll talk about what is basically geothermal heat pumps or what are heat pumps. So heat pumps are just simple devices that operate at the highest efficiency levels um, accomplished by just heat transporting systems. Basically, in a simple way to explain it, or a simple process or cycle, they follow the same procedure as the Carnot cycle, which um, I will cover in the fourth slide. They transfer heat in ways that can accomplish both heating and cooling, uh, while consuming just a small fraction of the amount of energy they move. The great advantage comes from the fact that they move heat that already exists. They don't generate heat and then move that heat because the reason why it's a good thing is because moving heat alone is just more efficient and cheaper than having to generate the heat and then having to also move it so overall it's a pretty good uh, return on investment really and they provide basically ideal methods to satisfy energy demands for heating and cooling buildings and spaces so without further ado we're going to go on to this video now the reason why i chose this video or what this video is going to cover really is it's going to cover how geothermal heat pumps work um in a more uh, slightly in-depth way with visuals it's basically a pretty good video to kind of just summarize what i'm going to talk about for 20 minutes 25 minutes and then hopefully i'll just add a bit more details here and there so yeah kenza and you trust kenza to deliver award-winning expertise and advice. In this video, you will learn how a ground source heat pump works. The purpose of a heat pump is to absorb low grade heat in one place where it is plentiful, then to transport, concentrate, and release it in another location where it can be used for space or water heating. The ground absorbs low grade solar energy by means of direct sunlight and rain. This gives the ground a year round temperature of around 8 to 12 degrees Celsius. But how can this low-grade heat be used to heat an entire building? A cold water antifreeze mix is pumped through the ground within a series of energy-absorbing pipes known as ground arrays. As heat naturally flows from warmer to cooler places, the antifreeze mix circulating around the array is constantly warmed by the ground's low-grade heat. Having increased in temperature, the antifreeze mixture is fed into a heat exchanger called the evaporator. Within the secondary sealed side of the evaporator heat exchanger is a refrigerant which acts as a heat transfer fluid. When the water antifreeze mixture enters the evaporator, the energy absorbed from the ground is transferred into the refrigerant which begins to boil and turn into a gas. The refrigerant never physically mixes with the water antifreeze mixture. They are separated like sandwich layers by the plates of the heat exchanger which permits the heat transfer. This gas is then fed into a compressor. The pressure of the refrigerant gas is increased in the compressor, which makes the gas temperature rise. The hot refrigerant gas then flows into a second heat exchanger called a condenser, which features an identical set of heat transfer plates. The condenser delivers water hot enough to serve the space heating system and, if required, the property's hot water needs. Having transferred its heat, the refrigerant gas reverts to a liquid. This liquid is then passed through an expansion valve at the end of the cycle to reduce its pressure and temperature, ready to commence the cycle all over again. Low-grade heat stored in the ground has been upgraded by the refrigeration process to deliver hot water. For each kilowatt consumed by the heat pump, 4 kilowatts of energy is generated, effectively meaning the cost per kilowatt hour is quartered. Plenty more. Okay, so basically really it does a good job summarizing how geothermal heat pumps. I'm just going to go over it again just to kind of solidify the information that was given. Um, basically, heat pumps 
that utilize the Earth's heat energy are fluid meditated mechanical devices that transfer heat from one location to another. They basically rely on just simple basic thermodynamics of fluid systems. Um, in the video, like what we saw in a refrigerator, a heat pump is used to remove heat from the interior air of the refrigerator into the air of the room in which the refrigerator is located. This process is exactly the same as the Carnot cycle, which we will cover in a bit, with the air of the refrigerator interior being the heat source used in the initial isothermal expansion phase of the cycle, and the room air being the heat sink into which um, heat is basically expelled from the cycle during the isothermal compression phase. Phase, yeah. Um, the fluid through which the heat transfer occurs is the refrigerant, which has long been an organic compound with a lower just boiling temperature than water, which makes it uh, turn into gas and steam, uh, at a, requiring basically less energy in general. So finally, the Karma cycle. Um, <laughs> the over here, there's like five pictures. Um, I'll try to fit in the explanation with what's given in the book. So basically. Uh, to start things off, there's the refrigerant on the far left, uh, nothing's acting on it, it's just stable, whatever. Uh, in the second picture, that's where heat starts going in, uh, basically a reversible isothermic gas expansion process occurs in that phase, where the uh, heat that is acting on the gas inside is at a high temperature, expanding, basically it expands the gas and does work on its surroundings. Eventually, uh, at a reversible adiabatic gas expansion process, the system is uh, thermally insulated. The gas continues to expand and do working or work on its surroundings, which causes the system to cool to a lower temperature. And then that's in the third picture, it's at its maximum, and that's where the surroundings start acting back on the gas, where it is a reversible isothermic gas compression phase. And in this process, uh, the surroundings do work to the gas and basically it causes a loss of heat the room air out is basically the energy going out so that's really just the Carnot cycle so to kind of summarize it faster and in a simpler way there's gas inside here right heat energy is going to be acting on the gas which is going to expand it eventually at a certain point because of how much it expanded it starts acting back on the energy that it's that is acting on it so then it starts so the surroundings start acting back on the gas and then pushes it back down so that's really how it works or the essence of how it works so um over here we have a picture of a house that employs a uh, vertical loop uh, of pipe that basically continually circulates a working fluid between a heat pump inside the building and the earth um, basically such a system it's a closed loop system uh, because the working fluid circulates uh, within the loop of the pipe it doesn't really exit it numerous other designs uh, have been employed for the closed loop systems including single and multiple granted here in the picture it's a singular one but usually in general we go with uh, a more hor like multiple horizontal closed loops um, open loop designs also exist uh, which uses groundwater that is pumped through a heat pump from a water well and then it's kind of re-injected back into the groundwater system. Uh, the basic principles of heat exchange of an open loop system are similar or the same as those to the closed loop system. However, the management of resources is kind of different but we're not really gonna cover that. Um, and then basically in this picture just to go a bit into details it's a schematic of a GHP plumbing system utilizing a single borehole, as we can see. And uh, yeah, the usually the typical depth of a borehole is around 90 meters. Um, they have the heat pump and HVAC units are typically located in the service closet in the house. That's just general basic information that I felt like should be included. <laughs> um, now, the thermodynamics of heat pumps. Um, heat pumps technology employed in ground source systems is based on the same thermodynamics principles as that employed by binary geothermal power generation systems using an organic Rankine cycle. Uh, basically, an organic Rankine cycle works by having heat, uh, water heat, or some kind of external heat, heat a chemical compound that is that has a lower boiling point than water, which turns it into gas and then uh, at a lower like cost and energy. 
So back to this second point, approximately zero degrees Celsius and about 100 to 400 kilopascals, which is the actual temperature and pressure, or the actual temperature and pressure will depend on the heat and the pump design and fluid used in the heat pump. Um, hence, okay, I'm sorry, uh, someone's calling me. Okay, hence the fluid in the heat pump will increase in the temperature at constant pressure. When the liquid in the heat pump reaches the temperature of the liquid vapor two-phase region, the liquid will absorb the heat at a constant pressure and temperature while the liquid vaporizes and will continue until its vaporization is complete. And finally, the amount of energy observe, uh, absorbed will depend upon the heat of vaporization of the fluid. Uh, at this point, if the vapor remains in contact with the heat exchanger, it will become a superheated, or it will become superheating, meaning it will acquire additional heat beyond the heat of vaporization. Uh, once the vapor has been formed, it is compressed through pressure about 10 times that at which it is vaporized. The vapor then moves through the heat exchanger in the room or building, losing heat at a constant pressure, cross, uh, back, crossing back through the two-phase liquid and gas. Um, so here we have a basically, how can I put this? Um, let's say we have a coil that contains a refrigerant fluid that has uh, a boiling point that is lower than that of the local subsurface, basically imp uh, working on the organic Rankine cycle. A compressor and a pressure reduction valve and a, capa and a capability to exchange heat with a room um, from the left side and with the earth on the right side. That's basically what the graph is showing, or the schematic. Now the refrigerant that is used varies by manufacturers and are now stipulated to be non-zone depleting compounds. An additional component required for a successful operation of the system is a pump that will circulate the water between the heat pumps and the earth uh, coupled loop. A complete heating cycle of the pump uh, involves the path from A through D, such as in the figure. And at A, the cool liquid refrigerant passes into a heat exchanger where it acquires heat from working fluids that has circulated throughout the Earth's uh, thermal reservoir. If the thermal exchange efficiency between the Earth and the circulating fluid is sufficiently high, the working fluid will have a temperature close to that of the Earth at the depth, or the, the depth of the pipe and that of the local subsurface. The refrigerant boils when it flows through the heat exchanger core that links it to the external fluid. As this heating of the refrigerant occurs, it goes through a phase transition from liquid to gas via boiling. And at B, the gas pressure is increased by a compression pump, resulting in an increase in the gas temperature, uh, reflecting the fact that work has been done by the compressor on the gas. And then the hot gas, basically, or the warm gas, uh, passes through another heat exchanger in the building where it is where its temperatures drop as it exchanges heat with the room at point C. And then the warm gas then passes through a pressure reduction valve D, which results in the pressure drop and the gas condensing back to liquid. And then the entire thing repeats again. So basically, it really uh, summarizes the video, but with a bit more calculations, I guess. But overall, it's just the same exact process. Um, so this is a table that kind of shows you the different compounds at which their boiling temperatures are, which could be useful in, I think this, okay, I don't have the a formula here, I think it's later on, yeah. Uh, basically, it shows you the different characteristics of different gases. Now, here, um, what, well, the, basically, I guess it's the, uh, what, pressure versus enthalpy graph, yeah. Not much to add here, honestly. I should have removed this, but we'll continue. <laughs> um, so the coefficient of performance and energy effici efficiency ratio. Here we have the uh, energy total formula, which is the 4,180 joules per second plus 0 0.8 times 1,500 joules per second. 4,180 joules per second is basically the heat capacity of water. Um, the efficiency of the heat pump process is measured by comparing the energy required to drive the system to the amount of heat transferred to vaporize the propane from a liquid to gaseous state takes approximately 425 kilojoules per kilogram of propane. The heat capacity of water is about 4180. Normally a temperature drop of about 10 degrees Celsius can be expected between the inflow and outflow of the heat exchanger for a ground loop on the right hand side of the heat pump in figure 11.3, which was supposed to be this, but 
Yeah. Um, hence, assuming the fluid flowing in the ground loop is simply water, one kilogram of geothermally heated water in the closed loop feeding the heat pump can vaporize approximately 10 kilograms of propane by adding just over 4 kilojoules of energy to the propane. The compressor in the heat pump is driven by a small electric motor with a power rating on the order of 1.5 kilowatts. The power consumed by the motor does work on the fluid, assuming that the motor has an efficiency of 0.8 and the flow rate for a geothermal fluid is 1 kilogram per second. And the rate of input of energy to the working fluid in the heat pump is not there. <laughs> um, ah, okay. So moving on to the a coefficient of performance and energy efficiency ratio here we have one of the equations is basically the energy uh, total energy over energy consumed uh, basically it's a measure of efficiency of the system uh, which can be obtained by comparing the total heat input which is 5380 to the amount of energy consumed and that gives you the ratio of these values in terms of efficiency and for the heating cycles this measure is called the coefficient of performance or COP and is defined as uh, delivered heat energy over compressor electrical demand. Um, one second. Okay, um, I apologize for what just happened. Uh, my brother kept on calling me because he just landed in the States. So yeah, um, <laughs> back to the presentation. Um, yeah, right now we're, gonna, we're talking about the, where did we leave off? Yeah, the coefficient of performance and is defined as delivered heat energy over compressor electrical demand. Um, basically, the thermodynamic significance of COP can be understood by considering the path uh, described in this figure. Yep, the enthalpy, the pressure versus enthalpy. That's why I included it, I just remembered. Um, the compression cycle increases the enthalpy of the gas from about 600 kilojoules per kilogram to about 680 kilojoules per kilogram. This is the work done by the compressor on the gas phase and is the electricity demand of the system. The heat delivered to the building is the heat of vaporization that is released when the UID condenses, or the, uh, the fluid condenses, which is where the long left pointing arrow crosses the two phase boundaries at about 390 kilojoules. Uh, yeah. Somewhere around here. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. Moving on to the uh, near surface thermal reservoir. Uh, I decided to include a picture that's not in the book. Um, the soil and the rock that makes up the top few hundred feet of the earth, they kind of act as the heat reservoir that evolves in response to two heat sources. Um, the source of this heat is the slow cooling of the earth's interior and radioactive decay in the crust. In deep mines around the world, temperatures at depths of between 1 to 2 kilometers can be as high as uh, 60 degrees Celsius, so 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, with local thermal gradients uh, as high as between 0.5 to 1.5 degrees Celsius per 100 feet. Um, such gradients would result in a surface temperature of between uh, 5 to 40 degrees Celsius, so we're speaking around 40 Fahrenheit to 100 Fahrenheit, somewhere along these lines, in the absence of the atmosphere or sun. Other regions have lower heat, and would be cooler, hence so solely on the basis of heat, there would be a wide range of temperatures in the sh uh, shallow subsurface with local hot spots and cold spots. Uh, this um, picture basically shows uh, the solar kind of heat, let's put it that way. I couldn't find a better picture on the book for some reason or in the book. Uh, what I'm trying to show you in this picture is basically how the atmosphere and the weather patterns affect how much heat is basically being reflected onto the earth uh rule of thumb or just you know general knowledge north side of the u.s is gonna have less solar radiance as opposed to the uh, bottom side of the u.s um so the atmosphere and solar insulation mitigate the extreme temperatures variability at the surface that would result solely from the heat. The average daily influx of solar energy that reaches the surface is about 200 watts per meter squared for the Earth. Uh, this energy input along with which interacts with the atmosphere to generate weather patterns moderates the variation in surface temperature um, throughout the world. This effect heats the top uh, of the uh, land surface during the day and allows it to slowly cool uh, during the night all within a restricted temperature range that is strongly dependent upon latitude, just like what we mentioned. Um, this diurnal uh, basically uh, effect slowly propagates into the subsurface. 
Added to this is the effect of the precip uh, precipitation, which when coupled with the uh, diurnal uh, effect of solar insulation, significantly adds to the thermal energy content of the subsurface. As rainfall occurs, or snow, whatever, the fate of the uh, resulting meteoric water is complex. Some of the water immediately returns to the atmosphere via ev evaporation. Some is taken up by plants and either incorporated into the plant material or respired back into the atmosphere. Some runs over the surface to local drainage systems and some percolates into the ground where it slowly flows in the subsurface to the local water table and enters the aquifer system. Um, yeah, the percolating water mo most significantly uh, impacts the subsurface thermal reservoir by absorbing or absorbing heat from the surface solar energy and transporting it to deeper levels in the soil. Um, okay, I'm so <laughs> I'm so sorry. My brother won't stop calling. Okay, yeah. <sighs> um, okay, for this we're gonna talk about the soil characteristics. Um, or this figure basically, it's gonna show the soil characteristics, and um. What I kind of want to show is th there are like two uh, thin curves for each season shown, like winter and summer basically. The outer curves represent temperature variation with depth for wet soils, whereas the inner curves are for dry soils. Um, the difference between these curves is due to the fact that um, heat flow over a specified distance, uh, the temperature gradient will be a direct inverse function of the thermal conductivity. So yeah, uh, for the closed, for like shallow closed loop systems that are installed in trenches, they must be designed with careful attention paid to the local soil properties and conditions. Um, the use of standard curves of thermal properties for generalized soil types is sufficient as a guide to estimate design patterns, but optimal performance will only be achieved by conducting a careful thorough survey of soil thermal conductivity and variability. When conducting such measurements, attention must also be paid to the local history of uh, the weather patterns because regional pr uh, precipitation patterns can strongly influence how thermal conductivity may change uh, in like each month. Uh, local agriculture results stations and soil conservation services offers can be a good resource for obtaining maps and dates on local conditions uh, but once measured if optimal designs are to be obtained second seasonal variability is much less of a design factor and if a bore system uh, or like if a bore system is installed uh, once depths of about 10 meters are exceeded the effects of fluctuating solar insulation and weather and weather are dumped out resulting in virtually constant thermal state because it just it can't really reach that depth um over here uh, i can't even speak over here we have the uh uh how much heat can be obtained based on the material used and everything. Uh, so basically Q equals CP times delta T times V, where Q is the heat that yeah can be obtained. CP is the constant pressure heat capacity. And uh, V is, uh, if I recall correctly, the number of moles per cubic meter of the material of interest. And uh, delta T is the temperature change for the material of interest. And on the right, you have the table for all the uh, information. And then here uh, we have a uh, basically is the amount of a uh, Q is the amount of heat that is required to be added or removed from the system to use the time. I'm trying to remember what is this? Um, one second. <laughs> Let us see. It is somewhere here. Yep. There we go. Uh, whether or not. To also show in the stable is thermal not heat. I remember it didn't have a name. To establish the rate at which this will occur. Okay, yeah, it doesn't have a name. The equation doesn't have a name. So, uh, however, whether or not the heat can be supplied at the needed rate depends on the thermal conductivity of the material in the vicinity of the closed loop. To establish the rate at which this will occur uh, requires solving this equation, which is what I included. I honestly don't remember why I don't have the name. Um, where delta Q is basically the amount of heat that is required to be added or removed from the system. Delta T is the time over which the heat is added or removed into C, which is going to be the constant volume heat capacity. Uh, final temperature minus initial temperature between states and then over the time, final time and initial time, all into the volume of interest. So yeah. <laughs> 